This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by ACP's Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Program, MCSAP 18. MKSAP 18 is a comprehensive learning system that meets physician needs for high-quality learning content and individual knowledge assessment. So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. Just visit www.acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. For entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you should always do your own homework and let us know the world. Hey guys, we're back. Hi, Matt. Hi. You didn't let me interrupt you. I'm, I'm trying something new here. I figure <laughs> if I surprise you with an introduction, then you can't interrupt me. <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty surprising. I like the cold start. We should even just not yeah, hi, the Paul. opening music. Just, <laughs> just go guns a-blazing. <laughs> so this is Matt Watto here with co-host Stuart Brigham. That's still me. And Paul Williams. Hey, guys. And Paul, you're going to tell the audience what it is that we do on this show. So happy to. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast, and we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice-changing knowledge. We also try to get to know our guests a little bit up front, hear what makes them tick, hear what makes them happy. Um, but I suppose you're welcome to skip that part if you like. There are timestamps in the show notes. If you neither want to tick nor be happy. And we do have a surprise guest co-host tonight, a, a returning co-host, the wonderful Dr. Molly Hoyblein. Glad to be back. Hi. I'm not sure why I'm a surprise, but. <laughs> <laughs> They've been demanding you. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a compliment, I guess. <laughs> back by popular demand. Molly, why don't you tell them what we talked about tonight on the show and, and, uh, and tell them about our wonderful guest. Awesome. So we have a great episode for you guys today where we kind of uh, take depression treatment to the next level. So we've had a couple excellent depression episodes in the past. So if you haven't listened before, I would encourage you to go back to episode 35 with Dr. Marius Commodore, where we started covering kind of how to choose a first line antidepressant, a little bit about starting and stopping treatment. And then number um, 115, where we talked about geriatric depression with uh, Dr. Dennis Pop- Popio. Um, and he kind of covered the basics of also starting antidepressants and first line augment- augmentation. So today we're going to take it to the next level with Dr. Patrick Finley, our wonderful guest. And um, we talk a lot about how to switch from one antidepressant to another, talking to patients about getting off antidepressants and withdrawal syndromes, um, and then some discussion about augmentation and uh, peripartum depression treatment. Our guest today is Dr. Patrick Finley. He's been serving as professor of clinical pharmacy at UCSF for the past 23 years, lecturing and coordinating courses at the schools of pharmacy, nursing, and medicine, as well as contributing to various residency programs at these institutions. He has published extensively in the medical literature on the topic of psychopharmacology and mood disorders, written over 20 original chapters in medical textbooks, and currently serves on three editorial boards. Most recently, he has been involved with genetic and epidemiologic investigations examining the safety and efficacy of antidepressants in peripartum depression. Dr. Finley has also spent much of the past two decades developing a collaborative care treatment model to improve the management of depression in primary care settings. To this end, he was first licensed as a medical provider in 2005, and his current practice is located at the UCSF Women's Health Center for Primary Care, which is where I work. Uh, His interest and expertise is in optimizing the appropriate use of psychotropic medications and has led to extensive involvement in patient advocacy at the local, state, and national levels. Did you guys hear about the nuclear button? I'm afraid to even respond. (laughs) It's never been depressed. Ah. (laughs) Don't encourage this, Molly. (laughs) (laughs) So Patrick, thank you for coming on the show. And can you give the audience a one-liner that describes yourself and definitely try to include something that you do outside the world of medicine? Well, I guess I'd call myself a a middle-aged psychopharmacology expert uh, living up in the wine country in Sonoma Valley uh, with my wife and and two teenage daughters. Um, I love the Northern California coastline and 
and, and also the history of the West um, and bluegrass music. That sounds really nice. I, I I'm, <laughs> <laughs> it was six degrees here yesterday, and yep. uh, I I could really go for some uh, some Northern California, you know, wine country. It sounds sounds awesome. Matt, I it's was thinking finally stopped raining. It's gorgeous right now. <laughs> <laughs> What am I doing with my life? You've <laughs> congratulations on figuring it out. You should see my commute. It's <laughs> all right. Well, let me ask an oldie but goodie. Uh, and I'm legitimately in the market for a good book recommendation. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be medical. But can you tell me um, a recent book that you've enjoyed or that you think people would enjoy reading? Uh, ironically, it's called Enjoy Every, Enjoy Every Sandwich, and it was written by Lee Lipsenthal. Um, it's not, it's a line from a Warren Zevon song, but he was a big Warren Zevon fan and he was a physician. Um, he worked a great deal in academia at UCSF and he developed esophageal cancer, which he knew was sedescens. And, and so it's all about, um, how we, his life completely changed, of course, but the things he valued changed dramatically. Um, and a lot of it is about the equivalent of mindfulness. Um, he, he became a big believer in meditation and he had some remarkable spiritual experiences uh, towards the end of his life. Hmm. And there's only one left in stock on Amazon. I, I'll be there back. <laughs> uh, let, let me uh, break for a second to, re- to remind everybody that this is the part in the show where Stuart Googles whatever the guest is talking about and, t- <laughs> and, and tells us and how I many copies of it are left on Ap- Amazon. And how much now it costs. <laughs> it's, like, it's, thir- it's a weird price, $32.93. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good, just in... Perfectly timed, immediately after talking about spirituality. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Anytime. That's what I'm here for. It's awesome. Molly? Yeah, is there something that you do on a regular basis or make a special habit of doing to maintain your own mental health and wellness? I run quite a bit. Um, I've been learning the banjo, and uh, I finished a screenplay recently. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Finished a screenplay, and you live in Sonoma Valley. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to field test a question with you and uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you feel comfortable, could you share with us your first patient complaint and what you learned from that? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is, is being late. You know, if, if they're not seen, you know, within 10 or 15 minutes of their scheduled appointment, this is a population that can get extremely irritable. And, and once you start off the, the appointment on the wrong foot, sometimes you can't gain any footing thereafter. Um, so I learned to be as, as, as prompt as possible. See, Matt, see, Matt, I, I think this question is going to work. <laughs> I, I was think yeah, I don't want to share my, my first patient complaint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I was there for that one. Why don't we, uh, why don't we go around and quickly, you, I, I'm going to go first for picks of the week, which is unusual, but you're, so I'm changing my pick of the week. Stuart and I were talking about this beforehand. So my, my pick of the week, I, uh, recently have had sort of like, I'm trying to recenter myself. And, uh, so I got, I have this, this app by Sam Harris was kind of making the rounds on all the podcasts recently. Sam Harris was like on multiple other podcasts that I listened to. He has his own podcast called waking up and his app is called waking up. And he's really like a, basically a, he teaches about meditation and mindfulness. The there's daily meditations. They take about 10 minutes each and he steps you through like different Um, meditation and mindfulness exercises and there's also sort of like short videos where he talks about different philosophy things and um, Sam Harris is sort of a famous for being an atheist but this app has nothing to do with that so you know I I wouldn't let that turn you off (laughs) a weirdly specific app if it did yeah I so I wouldn't (laughs) I wouldn't let that uh, you know so far I have not he has not talked about any of that so I wouldn't like you know if you don't like him for that reason, then then maybe it's not. Uh, you you shouldn't worry about that with the app. But uh, I have been enjoying the. I'm trying to get back into some sort of a mindfulness practice. Paul. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I actually was excited for the title of this one, and maybe hopefully we don't change it. But even if we do, it's still germane. I am going to choose the album Psychopharmacology by the excellent band Firewater. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is, it's an album I've loved for years. Um, it's a 2001 album. Uh, as I say, it's from the band Firewater, which is um, basically a musically collective, a musical collective fronted by this guy, Todd A., who was in the band Cop Shoot Cop, um, who also has some great albums out. But it is, 
it's a it's a spectacular album. They're a spectacular band. They do they describe themselves almost like a wedding band from hell. There's some klezmer. There's a little bit of, of folk in it. They just they they sort of mash up all these genres and put together these really interesting um, narrative type songs. Uh, so Seventh Avenue Static is a great one off that album. So I would recommend Psychopharmacology by Firewater. Wow. Can't promise I'll listen to that. But. <laughs> <laughs> no one will. I, I recognize already that no one's going to actually I'm sure if you will. There, there's, we have enough listeners. There's one person out there. We've already established this. <laughs> Molly? My pick is going to be a book by Jesmyn Ward. It's called Sing, Unburied, Sing. Uh, it's a novel, and it's it's set in Mississippi, kind of in the current time, and it's about a family and looking from different perspectives of different family members. Um and it's she just writes very beautifully. It's a very dark and sad book, but um, the mom is a drug addict and pretty neglectful to her children and very unlikable when you first hear about her. But then when you experience it from her standpoint, she becomes this you know very not necessarily understandable, but um sympathetic character. and um, it's just a really beautifully written book. All right, my pick of the week, and I'm I'm actually really excited about this one. This is a series that I've been watching on Amazon Prime called The Expanse, which is a, it's a sci-fi series that takes place in a, about 200 years. But interestingly enough, it's more of a uh, of an old school uh, noir type uh, uh, series. It's it's about this underlying intrigue that occurs in the background of this realistic sci-fi. So they they use like a c- centripetal force for gravity. They they don't they don't like wave any magic wands or anything for this. Um, and it's it's quite interesting. They, there's even like a huge Mormon ship that's going on a hundred year journey. It's that they end up smashing into. You know, anyways, it's a very interesting uh, sci-fi well, series. Very very interesting. And you've actually watched this one, so we don't have to worry I, about a a. Re- <laughs> So, hey, so I, I, I watched the, this, this is the only time I've actually purchased something on Amazon Prime. I watched the first two uh, seasons and I was like, uh, okay, the third season is not free. You, damn you. So you when bought I, the season pass. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Must be bucks. good. Must be good. So at this point, we will magically take an ad break. Paul, did you want to tell us a little bit about that? I would love to. We are lucky enough to be sponsored by MKSAP 18, uh, which is brought to you by ACP. It is a great tool for a variety of learning needs. I personally would not have passed the boards without it. And then it is also uh, great if you just want to pursue lifelong learning or use it as a reference um, or for helping other learners that you supervise. And then as an added bonus, it's great for nice chunks of both CME and MOC credits. I was like shocked by how many CME credits I got when I finished. (laughs) It's pretty great. Yeah. You can get it in either print or digital formats, but we highly recommend the MixUp 18 Complete because it's got the best value. It has everything you could possibly think of, the digital flashcards, board basics, virtual diagnosis, and the print. Frankly, it's all-inclusive. Yes, it is, Stuart. To echo what Paul was saying, MixApp, uh, I went through it a couple years ago when I was taking boards. I think I did MixApp 15 and MixApp 16. And I'm actually the kind of nerd that enjoyed going through all the questions and like seeing what I did and didn't know. I found it tremendously helpful. It's definitely a good way to like consolidate all the learning that you've done uh, and make sure you actually know what you're talking about because just passively reading is not as effective as doing the questions to actually test your self-knowledge. That's right. And Matt, did you know that there's also a money-back guarantee if you, for some reason, happen to not pass the ABIM exam? (laughs) Uh, I did not know that, Stuart, but that is actually good to know because there is a decent chance that I will not pass on the next try. (laughs) Lemire syndrome. (laughs) (laughs) So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning like our own Dr. Watto, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. We recommend you check it out. Just visit acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. And now we're back. All right, Molly. We're back. Molly, did, did you want to get <laughs> Molly, did you want to get into a case uh, from Cashlack Memorial Hospital? Sure, yeah. Uh, so we have Jess. She's a healthy 32-year-old woman, um, and she has had depression for a while now. We've been treating her, and we've started her on sertraline as her first-line option. We've increased her dose, and she's been taking 150 milligrams for about a month now, maybe six weeks. And her PHQ-9 really hasn't changed. She's still having very classic depression symptoms. She doesn't feel like the sertraline is really making any impact on her depression. And um, we just kind of wanted to talk about how you would 
make a change in in her medication. So she's had a pretty good course of trying a first line SSRI and it doesn't seem to have really impacted her mood symptoms. Um, and so just trying to think about how we would adjust to a next option. Um, so I guess to kind of start it off, Patrick, do you, do you think of SSRIs as pretty interchangeable or do you look at them in different terms and in, in based on their pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, um, how would you think about changing to the, to a next option? Uh, I mean, my first thought is I, I'd like to know more about our target symptoms. Um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in there. I, I think there's a lot of different illnesses that we kind of lump under the umbrella of depression. Uh, and there's, there's some people one end of the spectrum who have the equivalent of atypical depression where they're sleeping all the time, they're eating too much, a major cognitive deficits, I think they're great candidates for something that increases norepinephrine or dopamine, you know, like bupropion. At the other end of the spectrum are people who have a great deal of anxiety and irritability. Um, often they'll have generalized anxiety disorder too. Um, and they're great candidates for the serotonergic agents. So those are the kind of the two extremes. Unfortunately, most people are somewhere in the middle. Um, so presuming she's somewhere in the middle, I think the next step would probably be to transition her over to a different SSRI. To me, that was one of the major conclusions of the STAR-D trials, which I think you've covered in the past in, in one of the episodes, uh, where basically if you fill one SSRI, I think the conclusion of many experts was that the next step is a different SSRI. Mm -hmm. So I would probably transition her over to something like S-citalopram or citalopram. The, the way you know to kind of back away a little bit and talk about the SSRIs in general, in my mind, Prozac is at one end of the spectrum in the sense that it's it's very activating, which is good for some people, but not others. And at the other end of the spectrum is Paxil, which has so many drawbacks. It's remarkable how popular it became. Um, really severe withdrawal risk, weight gain, probably the worst sexual dysfunction, a uh, lot of interactions. It's a really potent inhibitor of CYP2D6. So I, I, usually I, I kind of exclude those two right away. And then what's left are the three in kind of in the middle, which are sertraline, S-citalopram, and citalopram. And for the most part, to me, they're kind of dealer's choice. You know, so what I like to know is if they have a member in the family who's had depression, uh, have any has anyone received one of those medications? Because people tend to already have built-in biases. Um, and I, I want to use that to my advantage. You know, maybe someone had a great response in, in case I would use that. Or maybe they've had a terrible response. So I don't want to go there and, and again bias the outcomes. And I think there there is some uh, really quite a bit of empiric research that's accumulating to back up that approach that responses to antidepressants do run in families, and it's not just the power of suggestion. There is a genetic determinant. So I, I want to throw something in here because one of the things that I do in my own clinical practice, is if someone is failing an SSRI, an SNRI, a DNRI, or any RI, I suppose. One of the things that I do is check a ferritin level because uh, iron is necessary to synthesize th these neurotransmitters and insufficient iron stores, there's nothing to inhibit the reuptake of. What do you think about checking iron stores in a patient who fails SSRI therapy? You know, to be honest, I haven't heard of that before. Okay. Um, that's, that's news to me. Yeah, it's, it's a cofactor in the rate-limiting step of uh, synthesis of serotonin and then downstream from that melatonin. It's also... Uh, uh, involved in the rate-limiting step of dopamine and the conversion to L-dopa, and then downstream from that dopamine, the norepi and epi. So I, I, that, that's one of the reasons why I check a ferritin level in those patients. And what I'll do is I'll replace the iron deficiency first um, while I'm trying to adjust their, uh, their, their meds. Interesting. It, I mean, it, it kind of makes me think of MTHFR in the fact that people mm -hmm. are believing more and more in, in checking right. MTHFR status. Um, you know, if someone... I guess to, to explain a little bit further, um, folic acid does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, it has to be metabolized to L-methylfolate, uh, right. which occurs via MTHFR. Um, the significance of that is that some people, it, it's a polymorphic enzyme, and some people don't really have a functional yeah. copy of it, if you will. Um, and if they don't have that, then they don't readily synthesize neurotransmitters because L-methylfolate is a, a cofactor in the synthesis of neurotransmitters in the yeah. CNS. So already they're kind of behind the eight ball depending on their MTHFR status. Um, where I find it's really valuable is someone who's had multiple trials and maybe they had a partial response, but they never really achieve remission. Mm -hmm. um, I may che check an MTHFR, uh, and if they do, um, and if they are deficient, 
in a functional copy of that gene, um, I think the natural thing to do is is to prescribe uh, L-methylfolate. Right. Um, there's a prescription product, Deplin, which is not covered by most insurers adequately, so it's really expensive, but uh, L-methylfolate is available online, um, and the usual dose is 7.5 to 15 milligrams a day. Some of the studies are actually are so positive, they're almost hard to believe, the augmentation studies with it. Yeah, um, you, you know, to, to, to kind of piggyback on that, uh, one, so, so there is... So talking about um, more nutrient deficiencies in association with with mood disorders, there was a study that was published in the European Journal of Nutrition in 2017, the, t- the title of which is The Efficacy of Early Iron Supplementation on Postpartum Depression, Randomized Double-Blind Placebo-Controlled Trial. That So they randomized 70 women to receiving iron or not, and then followed up on the incidence of postpartum depression. And those patients who received iron supplementation had a postpartum depression that was 42.8% lower than those patients who didn't during the six-week week follow-up period, suggesting that there was actually a clear a clear association with the uh, supplementation of iron and reduction of postpartum depression symptoms. Really interesting. We uh, we did a study a few years ago uh, looking at um, some of the some of the uh, not only genetic determinants but also some of the environmental determinants of developing postpartum depression. Um, there was a, a series of surveys that these folks p- filled out, uh, and then we also did this. We looked at certain candidate genes, um, and they, we actually had some really surprising results. The, uh, some not so, pri- so surprising, like if you look at the environmental uh, triggers or risk factors, it's things like unwanted pregnancy, not mm-hmm. being in a healthy relationship, uh, history of trauma in the past. Um, but some things didn't fall out, which have long been attributed to the development of postpartum depression, like difficulty breastfeeding. There was no mm-hmm. significance there at all. The genetic piece was the most interesting, though. There were actually two candidate genes which were really strongly associated with the development of postpartum depression. Uh, one was an estrogen receptor, and one was a serotonin receptor. Um, our, we had hoped that we would actually acquire an R01 uh, grant by virtue of this pilot study we did, because the results were pretty eye-opening. Um, unfortunately, we weren't funded, uh, but... Mm. I, I think the bottom line is in terms of postpartum depression, as opposed to antipartum depression, it's really hard to put your finger on a single risk factor other than maybe the development of antipartum depression. In other words, the strongest right. risk factor for postpartum depression is antipartum. Um, yeah. Family history almost certainly has something to do with it, too. But beyond that, there's a lot of different factors, and it's hard to say which is the strongest. Well, I do want to, we are going to go through treatment of postpartum depression, but why don't we swing back to a little bit more of the, of the basics and we'll, we'll sort of build up to that. So Molly, what was the next, uh, so we were sort of in our, in our first case here, we're sort of talking about the choice of agents. It sounds like the, the SSRIs that you would recommend are escitalopram, citalopram, and sertraline, um, unless they have other, unless they're at like one end of the spectrum, you said, where they need something activating or sedating. Am I kind of recapping the initial? More or less. Okay. Yeah. All right. Molly, where did you want to go next with the, this case? Sure. Yeah. So I guess if, if we've kind of decided that she hasn't responded well to sertraline and she's on a maximum reasonable dose, um, and so we decide we want to say switch her over to escitalopram. How do you recommend doing that? What what kind of t- cross titration do you do, or do you just immediately swap over if it's a within class change? Well, technically, if, if you if you look at the medical literature, there's there was at least one prospective study I'm aware of where they switched people regardless of the dose from one SSRI to another uh, in one day, um, uh-huh. and it was extremely well tolerated. Surprisingly. But in my experience, it seems like if someone's at a relatively high dose of an SSRI and they've been on that for a few months, I like to kind of quickly lower it and then switch over. Um, It's just really hard to say what an equivalent dose is. So in this case, you know, I probably lower the 150 milligrams to 100 milligrams for a week, Um, maybe the next week lower to 50 and then switch over to say five milligrams of s citalopram or, or 10 milligrams of citalopram. So they'd be on the 5 or 10 while they're still on the 50 of the sertraline? No, I would at, at, I would stop the 50 and the next day start either citalopram or escitalopram. Some, if someone's on a really high dose of an SNRI, it's a little trickier because uh, the, the risk of withdrawal with venlafaxine and duloxetine is a little more profound. 
In that case, I may actually cross titrate, um, you know, lower the, the, the venlafaxine to something like 75 or 37.5, and then start a low dose of the citalopram or the s citalopram or the sertraline. Um, so they may actually be on the combination briefly. Um, I, personally, I think serotonin syndrome is a real phenomenon. So I really try to avoid putting myself in a situation <laughs> where that might occur. So, and can I ask about the converse? Because usually what I typically see is that we're treating a patient for depression, maybe the SSRI is not doing it. And I'm like, oh, right, they have pain as well. So you try to make the switch to an SNRI. What is your, is there a cross titration process for the opposite way around rather than going from SNR to SSRI? What's vice versa look like to you? I actually think it's easier to go from an SSRI to an SNRI. Um, the SSRIs just tend to be better tolerated. You know, there, uh, Cipriani did the, this extensive review last year. I think I saw it in the notes somewhere um, where he was looking at the relative tolerability and efficacy head to head of the different antidepressants. And there's no question that if you compare an SSRI to an SNRI um, in a randomized controlled trial, uh, that the dropout rates are always higher with the SNRIs. So I, I, I think it's easier going from an SSRI to an SNRI. Um, at least the withdrawal is not as significant. The big question is, can they tolerate the SNRI? And how do you counsel patients about withdrawal? I mean, I usually kind of tell them that they may expect to feel a little dizzy or woozy. And, you know, if they're feeling bad, we can decrease the the speed of the change of medication. But what other kind of side effects do you see? Or how do you talk to patients about it? Yeah, I, I think the profound dizziness is really the hallmark um, of withdrawal. Uh, other things, you know, they, they talk about flu-like symptoms, which are kind of vague, but you'll see that in the literature a lot, um, or an increase in anxiety. Um, the electrical phenomenon and those related symptoms, I, I think are really fascinating because patients will often talk about these brain zaps and I have no earthly idea what that is, but they'll describe that all the time in chat rooms and, and so forth. Um, also, people talk about their face feeling numb or if they turn their head really quickly, their stars in their lateral gaze. Um, it's, it's not life-threatening, I'll tell them, but it can be really uncomfortable, and it's not uncommon that people wind up in, in the emergency room and, and they don't really understand what's wrong with them. How mm -hmm. often someone does a really bad job with medication reconciliation, mm -hmm. yep. and they go without their SSRI and SNRI, and all of a sudden they develop these weird symptoms and right. get this million-dollar workup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. Or they go without their Wilbutrin and have uh, like NMS-type presentation. I, I want to try to recap because I think we we went through the cross titration thing a little bit fast. I'm I'm a little bit I'm the slow one on the show. Stewart Stewart is definitely uh, the the quicker one with this kind of thing. So you when you're when you're coming down from an SSRI and the 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 prototype we're using was sertraline. So if someone's on 150, you take them to 100 for a week, 50 for a week. And then the next week, you might start five or 10 of something like escitalopram. And then you would kind of go from there as as monotherapy with that agent, right? And and yeah, and you had stepped them down to fifty. So if so, I guess so, presumably if someone was on fifty, I don't know if you would would you just start the next day? You might stop that directly, or or maybe you would go to twenty five for a week, and then and then kind of switch over at, at some predetermined day. It really depends on the patient and how okay. well they're tolerating this this quick reduction in their medication. Because okay. if they're already not tolerating it well, then obviously you're going to be extremely mm. conservative. Got it. Another piece of information that's helpful, though, is to ask them if they've ever run out of their medication for a few days or skipped it for a few days. And if they have profound withdrawal, right. again, you're going to be much more conservative. Some people can tolerate it fine, uh, skipping it for several days. I don't advocate that. But, you know, if you, if, if you have that knowledge about their history, it's you can, right. they can probably talk, titrate it pretty quick tolerate a pretty quick um, uh, discontinuation and initiation of the new medication. Okay. And with the SNRIs, we were using venlafaxine as our prototype. And you said that generally you, because I know that goes, I've seen patients as high as 300 or 225. So you would get them down to 75 milligrams or 37.5 milligrams a day. And then that one, you said you might cross titrate where they might for a very short period of time be on two agents. Right. Again, depending on the patient. So for maybe like a, a couple days or a week or so, you might overlap with a very low dose of an SSRI and then be, before you stop the SNRI? Right. Okay. I mean, sw switches are always so tricky because you, you don't know if, if you're, you're running the risk of withdrawal or if they're just not tolerating the new medication. Right. And so if you make both changes at the same time, it's... Um, 
I, I, I kind of brace them for the fact that I don't know exactly what's going to yeah. happen. We just kind of have to see how it goes. What I wanted to ask you as a follow up there is we, we talked about the signs, the symptoms of withdrawal, but we didn't really say like, can you give us an example of like a patient who has withdrawn? Like what were they coming off of and why did they withdraw and how might they have avoided it? Like, can you give us like maybe a typical case that you would see? Well, it, I, I educate them up front in general that if they go more than two or three days without the medication, they're going to start to run the risk of withdrawal because um, that's usually the onset. Um, the peak can really vary, uh, but that's usually the onset. Okay. I'm sorry. What was the rest of the question? Well, that I mean, that was the main that was the main just just of the question. So you're saying the the withdrawal is it can just happen if someone someone goes, I don't know, someone goes on vacation for a couple of days and forgets their sertraline and they're on 100 milligrams a day they might start to experience withdrawal on the third or fourth day of the vacation. That might be something that is that a, that's a plausible case. Right. Okay. And then some people are so sensitive to it. I've, I've had situations um, back in the day when we were prescribing more pax, paroxetine that you could, te- you could actually slowly lower their dose down to like 2.5 milligrams, um, you know, and they would be on that for a month or more and you'd stop it and they would still have significant withdrawal. And th- those are th- some of those rare instances where you may think about actually starting fluoxetine, taking them off of the paroxetine, and then the fluoxetine is es- essentially self-tapering. Right. Yeah, I was reading it has a half-life of 7 to 10 days or some somewhere in that in that range. Right. The active metabolite has a half-life of about a week. So while we're on the topic, what just because paroxetine sounds so potentially noxious, potentially, potentially noxious, when... when uh, <laughs> A, a rare misspeak for Dr. Williams. Yeah, when when would you reach for paroxetine, I guess is the question I might ask you. It sounds like there's just so many potential downsides to it. When is it really your drug of choice? If they told me they'd been on it previously and they had a good experience, and that's about it. <laughs> <All> right. There. <laughs> Thank you. Never started. Got it. In the uh, in the geriatric clinic that I formerly worked in, I had a f- I inherited a fair number of patients on it. And, uh, some of them, but some of them seem to be fairly cavalier about like, oh yeah, I, sometimes I don't take it. Sometimes I do, but I, so, so maybe I wasn't as heightened to the, the withdrawal as I should have been. Now I have to say, I think this conversation presupposes a level of adherence with these medications that I typically don't see. <laughs> Usually for me, the patients show up and say, yeah, I stopped taking it two weeks ago because it wasn't working for me. And then we have right. to figure something else out. So the cross titration seems to be less of an issue, um, for me at least. <laughs> I, I would just emphasize that everyone's sensitivity to withdrawal is different. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I've actually seen patients who swear that if they take their medication as little as like three or four hours late, they start to feel some of the dizziness. Wow. Which, you know, based on the pharmacokinetics and the medical literature doesn't make sense. And I don't think they're particularly dramatic. I think this really is happening to them. But this is good to know because I... I, I'm certain I must have missed a case like somebody came in complaining of these exact symptoms and I was I probably sent them to the ER thinking they were having a stroke or some sort of complex migraine or something. Hmm. I don't want to prolong it too much longer, but there there is one other element here that I need to mention. That is that there are people who are ultra rapid metabolizers. Um, you know, at CYP 2D6, some of the SSRIs are metabolized via a cytochrome P450 2D6. And the people who are ultra rapid metabolizers may actually have a really short half life, um, much shorter than the general population. Those may be the people who have this onset of withdrawal symptoms. You know, if they're just taking it four or five, six hours late. Is there anybody in practice that you're aware of that's actually checking like pharmacogenomic studies for, on, on these patients? Kind of like checking if the, who is a rapid metabolizer? Maybe f- for someone who's had like very difficult to, to treat depression. Some psychiatrists believe in it. Um, it's mostly people I hear talking about it on listservs, okay. you know, national psychiatry <laughs> listservs. Most of the people I work with don't do it routinely. Okay. You know, unless you're dealing with a medication, you know, like tamoxifen, where you have to know their um, their status uh, because it's a pro drug and it's completely worthless if they're a poor metabolizer. Um, Atomoxetine is another medication where you might think about doing it. Um, uh, tramadol. Because uh, tramadol is also a pro drug, and it's not going to give you any kind of analgesic effect if you're a poor metabolizer. Right. Yeah. David Jerlink has a great post about that uh, on the Toxin Hound blog, which we can link to in the show notes. Um, it references ODB as well. Uh, apparently, he died with tramadol in his system, which is my favorite, 
my favorite teaching point from that from that blog post. Um, okay, Bali, where where can we go with this next? Get us back on track. We're talking about Wu Tang. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so going back to Jess, so if we've tried to, uh, we've cross titrated her to escitalopram, and uh, she's doing pretty well on it, and she's she's feeling less depressed, feels like she is having a good reaction to it, um, but she's thinking about starting a, to get pregnant soon, and wants to know if if this medication is safe during pregnancy, and would she have to stop it if she were breastfeeding, and what she needs to worry about in terms of of treatment around pregnancy. I mean, I think the first step for me would be to see what her, her psychiatric history is like. You know, how many episodes has she had in the past? How severe were they? Just to let, so I can gauge what the likelihood is of her relapsing during the pregnancy. Um, you know, if it turns out she does have a really impressive history, the odds are she's probably going to have to continue with the medication through the pregnancy. And so then it's a matter of reviewing with her the evidence that the SSRIs in general are safe during pregnancy, with the exception of Paxil, paroxetine. Uh you know, if, if she's, if she wants more information, which is not uncommon, you know, this tends to be a, a pretty involved conversation in my experience. Um, I may refer them, for instance, to the Mass General Women, Women's Mental Health website, Massachusetts General Women's Mental Health, um, which has a lot of information for the lay public. Um, but I also know a lot of uh, clinicians who use that website. Um, the other piece of evidence I was really impressed with was the AHRQ report that came out like two or three years ago which was extremely evidence-based. Um, their, their conclusions about the risk of adverse outcomes in women exposed to antidepressants during pregnancy um, was remarkable in the sense that they really didn't find a great deal of risk. Um, the, two, the two essential risks that people need to be aware of are abstinence syndrome, uh, which is where when the woman delivers, um, the baby may have this period of time, usually it's 24 to 48 hours, where they're particularly fussy, uh, may not have much of an appetite. Worst case scenario is there can be some respiratory difficulties, but that's really rare. And, it, and I would emphasize it's short lived. Um, so that's the one risk is abstinence syndrome. The other one um, is that women who are on antidepressants during pregnancy um, do tend to deliver a little bit sooner. Um, they're not necessarily premature, but if you look at the numbers, they deliver slightly sooner and the children actually weigh a little bit less. Um, those were the, the two chief risks with the SSRIs. Um, I was on an um, Institute of Medicine commission a few years ago, and I think one of the most important take-home points was that the risks of untreated depression during pregnancy are much greater than the risks of antidepressants during pregnancy. Sorry, a great message to, to re reiterate with patients that, that their mental health is very important for the baby's health. And but inevitably, these studies come out in, that the media misinterprets, where they're comparing a population of women who are depressed and on antidepressants during pregnancy to women who are not depressed. And we know that depression itself during pregnancy carries a huge risk of, for one thing, miscarriage, um, which a lot of people don't really focus on. But uh, it's... It, it never ceases to amaze me how, you know, you have these selection biases, which are so profound. How can you say anything uh, unequivocally from these studies? And yet the media does. So it's kind of taking it to say she continues on her escitalopram and is doing well, and then she gives birth and is breastfeeding. Is that safe to continue on? Or say someone who does have postpartum depression who was never treated previously, and it's severe enough to think about medication. Are there any that you look out for with breastfeeding? Well, if I can return to the HRQ report again, their conclusion was that there is no risk. It was that explicit. They said there is no any. risk. Um, specifically with the SSRIs is what they focused on, and that's what I remember best, just because we mm -hmm. tend to use them mostly during pregnancy. I think the consensus is that sertraline is probably the antidepressant of choice during pregnancy. You know, when you're talking about the, the risks of medications um, in, in breastfeeding, you're really asking three questions. You know, one is, does it get into the breast milk? Two is, does it, d does, does the child have detectable levels? And three is, are there any adverse outcomes associated with that? And I, I think we can safely conclude that the vast majority of psychotropes get into the breast milk, you know, because they, they tend to be very lipophilic, otherwise they wouldn't cross the blood brain barrier. And it's kind of those same properties that lead them to getting into appreciable quantities in breast milk. But in terms of those three questions you're asking, the answer with the SSRI is, you know, across the board is that they appear to be safe. I wanted to go back and, and ask more of a general question. We, we've we talked about this a little bit on other shows, but I wanted to see how you do this in your practice. How are you monitoring 
response to therapy? What do you consider a remission? What do you consider just a partial response? We use a PHQ-9 pretty religiously. Um, it's actually not my favorite. Uh, I think the quids is better. Um, the inventory for depressive symptoms, a shortened version, an abbreviated version. The, the PHQ-9, PHQ-9 is nice in the sense that it actually assesses all nine symptoms. But if you look at the way it's written, it's frequency, it's not severity. It's like how often you have these symptoms. So it's not always that helpful. Um, we also use it, the, the GAD-6 um, to assess generalized anxiety disorder on a routine basis. So, you know, between those things, I, I have a pretty good handle on how well they're doing. You know, I would emphasize that in this day and age, we are shooting for remission, uh, which is less than five on, on, on the PHQ-9, um, which isn't always possible depending on the other things they have going on in their life um, and other comorbidities, medical comorbidities. Uh, but we tend to, to try to get them less than five because it, I think one of the, the areas where I see providers often um, come up short is, is in terms of being content with the patient who's just doing better uh, as opposed to getting well. Um, and that's why we wind up augmenting a lot with, with other agents. How do you talk patients into taking more medicines when they're feeling better but not entirely well? I mean, I, I feel like a lot of patients will come back to me and say, oh, I'm I'm better enough and I don't want to keep playing with medications and I don't want to take a higher dose. That is a difficult co conversation. I mean, but I, again, I guess that's one of the benefits of routinely measuring their depressive symptoms with a survey because it's, it's this objective piece of evidence that you can show them and say, see, you, you still have a lot of room for improvement here. Um, you know, we've maximized the first medication. And if we use a medication with, if we add a medication with a different mechanism of action, it can actually be synergistic and we can get to where we want to go. Um, you know, I tend to use a lot of bupropion as an augmenting agent with the SSRIs. And I think there's a lot of benefits to bupropion that patient aren't, patients aren't aware of, you know, like the improvement in cognitive symptoms, uh, curbing their appetite, improving their energy. And so they're usually a little more amenable to something like bupropion. Um, I think the discussion you have when you're adding an atypical antipsychotic may be a little bit trickier. Uh, just because of the risks of metabolic syndrome and, and the fact that you're giving them a quote-unquote atypical antipsychotic. <laughs> I had read something about using immediate release bupropion, uh, like 75 to 100 milligrams to alleviate, ameliorate some of the sexual side effects of SSRIs. Is, is, that, is that something that's common? Is it commonly prescribed in that manner? Yeah. Well, do you use it in that fashion? Is it something that we should be thinking about? Very often. Uh, in fact, there, there, there was a randomized controlled trial uh, patients who specifically had antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction, and about 50% of them uh, responded to a dose as low as 150 milligrams. And if, if they didn't respond, they increased it to 300, and about 50% of the remaining population uh, responded. So that's a really good response rate. And I mean, basically, those who received placebo, the response rate was <laughs> pretty close to zero. You know, it is that effective. Um, so I use quite a bit of it when I can. The problem is there's some patients who don't tolerate bupropion. You know, some of them will tell you that they just drink, felt like they drank too much coffee. Um, and it really seems like there's two camps. One camp has a great response to it. It's like, why wasn't I on this before? And the other camp's like, this is horrible. Why would you give this to someone? And to me, it's, it's so stark. I almost wonder if there's some kind of genetic predeterminant there that we haven't identified yet. But yeah, I do use a lot of bupropion to answer your question for sexual dysfunction. If that doesn't work, we're kind of out of luck. Mm. Um, you know, there's a little bit of evidence with um, buspirone. There's a little bit of evidence with amantadine. Um, there's no question that medications like Viagra work, even in women, specifically for antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction. But uh, I would say I, the patients I treat, about 90% of them are female, and they don't really want to consider something like Viagra. Right, so, so Denifil. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, right. We were, we were talking about monitoring symptoms. What, how do you counsel patients that want to discontinue like an antidepressant agent? And uh, we're eventually going to ask you about anxiety, but let's start with antidepressants. How, how long do you tell them they need to be on therapy before you consider withdrawing medication completely? Well, on day one, I tell them that they have to continue whatever they're on for a minimum of six months after they achieve remission. Um, we used to say six months from the start, but that really didn't make sense because some of these patients, it takes two or three months before you get anywhere near there. So it's six months from the time that they're well. 
Um, and then I, I st stressed to them the importance of this six month visit um, because it's a pretty involved conversation about whether or not to come off of it. Um, you know, if they're in psychotherapy, I think they have a better prognosis. Um, so that I, I weigh that factor in in terms of whether or not to come off of it, as well as the number of previous episodes and and maybe concurrent stressors, like if they're caring for someone with Alzheimer's dementia or something. Um, and then we sit down and I talk about um, really two things. One is the, the, uh, what withdrawal looks like and how we're going to try to avoid it. Um, and secondly, the risk of relapse and, and when is the highest risk? Because um, they're two completely different phenomenons with different time courses and, and they need to distinguish between those two. Do you think that would be helpful to actually like say that for the audience so they can counsel patients on that? Is that, is that a long discussion or is that some, something you think you could quickly summarize for the audience? Sure. Um, if I think that they, they are a good candidate for coming off the medication, um, I'll let them know that. Uh, I'm, I'm always surprised at how many of them will tell me, well, it's, it's improved my life so dramatically. Why do I want to come off of it? <laughs> right. And this could be a person who six months earlier said, I don't even want to consider that. And I kind of convince them that, that they really don't have a lot to lose. And then they have this great experience and they're like, I don't want to come off of it. But if they are a good candidate and they're willing to consider coming off of it, um, I'll let them know that uh, we have to, typically we have to taper it very slowly. And I, I like to emphasize that I do it slowly when they're coming off of the medication, uh, because if they start to have symptoms of relapse, then we can just go right back up to where we were and they're not going to crash and burn in the meantime. Um, so we'll, we'll taper it very slowly and I'll, I'll let them know the symptoms of withdrawal. Uh, that may be telling us we're going too fast. Um, and then we'll talk about the time course of relapse, how the real risk of relapse is actually two months out. That's the highest risk of relapse. Um, so we won't, won't know we're out of the woods for a little while yet. And, and I tend to follow up with them, you know, a couple of months thereafter via an email message. I guess one question, if you don't mind, is when when would you consider reaching for the atypical antipsychotic? When is that an agent of choice as opposed to propropion for augmentation on something that is already kind of working? I think it's really important to have kind of a treatment algorithm in, in your mind from, from day one. <laughs> you yeah. know, and we tend to start with the SSRIs. So, you know, we optimize them. And if they have a partial response, you know, my next question is, well, what are the residual symptoms? Does it look more like anxiety? Then I may add something like buspirone. Um, whereas does it look more like uh, cognitive deficits, um, sleeping too much, then I may add something like bupropion. I will say that I've had, I think I've had better luck adding bupropion to SSRIs than buspirone. Um, in the literature, they'll talk about the fact that it's because people don't push the dose of buspirone high enough. Uh, in the STAR-D trials, bupropion was more effective than buspirone. Um, remarkably so, actually. But I don't, in my, to my knowledge, I don't think they actually looked at whether it was an an anxious variety of depression or an atypical variety. But but in general, that's the first augmentation step is either buspirone or bupropion. After that, I've had really good luck with T3, uh, with Cytomel. Um, and in fact, in the STAR-D trials, it was remarkably effective. Uh, there, there's been six published studies, well done studies. Five out of the six were very positive. The only negative one, they had a really high placebo response rate. Um, What's kind of interesting about that is it's really effective in women specifically and not men. Uh, that's been borne out of the studies. And it's very rapidly effective. And we're talking about like micro doses, like 25 micrograms of T3. So that I may go there next. Uh, I may think about L-methylfolate. Um, you know, when I've, if there's still a, a robust anxious component, I may try something like gabapentin or pregabalin. Um, and at that point, I may consider an atypical. You know, if you are going to prescribe an atypical, there's a lot more monitoring involved in terms of metabolic parameters. Um, some of them are still quite a bit expensive, uh, but they are really effective. I mean, cutiapine in particular is extremely effective. There's even good evidence it's effective for monotherapy. But again, it, it carries a substantial risk of, of metabolic syndrome. I feel like it's one of the few that I actually have patients ask me for. Um, like it's <laughs> Like they, they really sort of beg for the quetiapine more than sort of any other agents that I've used. But I tend to use more uh, aripiprazole and lorazidone just because there's less of a risk of metabolic syndrome. And I, I guess the other question I had was about the bispirone. Do you see, uh, because that may, my own sort of empiric experience, it just seems to be more tolerability that seems to be the issue when you push the dose. I feel like patients often report a lot of dizziness and just don't tolerate higher doses of that. Is that the case or have I just been very unlucky? No, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, I, to get back to the STAR-D trial again, where they compared bispirone to bupropion augmentation, 
there was a lot more side effects with the respirone uh, than than I've actually seen in my practice. Although you're absolutely right, at higher doses, you do see this dysphoria or dizziness. Um, some people have kind of a paradoxical reaction to to where they'll tell me they actually become more anxious when they start to take it, oh. um, which is kind of interesting. Okay. We, uh, I want to just plan the rest of our time here because I think we need to wrap up in the next like 10 minutes here. Um, so let's, let's kind of take stock. We haven't, um, I, I certainly could ask like a million more questions about augmentation and maybe that's the place to go since we're already there. Um, like uh, maybe specific dosing of the atypical antipsychotics or, um, or the, the you 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 dropped in the pregabalin gabapentin thing. I was not aware of that until I was like reading about anxiety preparing for this, and I saw that sometimes they use that as augmenta- an augmenta agent. I've never heard of that, yeah. so I think that's an interesting place to go. Um, we didn't talk about trazodone or mirtazapine. Um, I don't I don't think we can do it all. So I don't know what Paul you you have an opinion. I can tell. <laughs> so many. I would love to hear about mirtazapine because my residents think it's a, a silver bullet, but I, we don't have to go there necessarily. But I feel like it's it's much hyped and I don't ever see a whole lot of actual effect from it. Well, I think you have to choose the patient appropriately. You, you know, ideally, it's someone who who maybe needs an appetite stimulant, mm-hmm. uh, someone who, who's not sleeping at all. Um, my patient population, it's, it's primary care, so they tend to be fairly highly functioning. In fact, a lot of them are actually UC San Francisco employees. Um, and so when you describe the side effects of mirtazapine to them, that's not something that appeals to them. But like in extended care facilities, it's quite popular. Right. Um, it, it's I think it's a really interesting medication. Um, its mechanisms totally unlike the other uh, medications that we've talked about. Um, it was actually designed to be an antihistamine, uh, which is why it's really sedating at low doses. And then at high doses, you get more of this noradrenergic effect. It's kind of the opposite of clonidine is the way I look at it in terms of its effect on alpha-2 autoreceptors. So rather than a decrease in norepinephrine effect, you see an increase, uh, which is why there's less sedation, less appetite stimulation at these higher doses. Um, but it also blocks 5-HT3, uh, which is really interesting. That's what um, the uh, well, it's what Zofran does, uh, the medications we use for nausea. Um, and vortioxetine, which we mentioned briefly, that's one of its principal pharmacological actions is to block 5-HT3. Um, and people think that's why vortioxine may be a unique antidepressant, but maybe that's why also mirtazapine is unique. We just don't know. Mm. Is, is vortioxetine considered an SSRI? It's, it's a really complex medication. It has a lot of different effects at serotonin receptors, uh, both as an agonist and an antagonist. The 5-HT3 effect is probably the most relevant and they actually think that's that may be what's imparting some of its neurocognitive benefits. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. As you, as you might be aware, they've really marketed vortioxetine as the antidepressant for cognitive deficits. Um, just because it's been well studied, the study I want to see is bupropion versus vortioxetine, and that hasn't been done. Because bupropion may very well have those same cognitive benefits. So, Patrick, if we chose to augment with an atypical antipsychotic, what kind of dosing would you use? So, for example, for aripiprazole, do you just stay with a low dose or do you try to increase the dose over time? To be honest with you, that, that <laughs> I always have to look it up because the, the okay. dosing is, is, is substantially different, um, you know, for uh, for augmenting antidepressants versus bipolar disorder versus schizophrenia. And so I, I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. I don't remember off the top of my head, other than the fact that it's much lower than you would use for those other two indications. Do you have a favorite favorite spot to look that up? Do you use Lexicomp, Micromedics, one of those? Lexicomp. Um, if I'm going to use a textbook, I'm a real believer in Stephen Stahl's publications. He's To me, he's, he's kind of the man who brought psychopharmacology to the masses. Uh, he's a PhD, MD, a psychiatrist, kind of his own cottage industry, he, he, but his books are excellent. And even at that low dose, the metabolic risks are pretty significant. They are. What's kind of interesting about that, though, is if you look at the monitoring guidelines, um, even with the, the, the atypical antipsychotics that we really don't think cause a lot of weight gain, it's still recommended that you get these periodic checks of their um, their glucose levels and in their total body weight and their lipids and, and whatnot. Um, so that's a little bit laborious. Has there been, is there anything we can do other than just the, the routine diet and lifestyle thing? Is there anything that's been proven to sort of mitigate that? 
Not really. You know, they thought the H2 blockers were the magic bullet for a while. Um, I may be overlooking something recently, but I'm not aware of, of a magic bullet right now. It's, I mean, it, I think best guess is that it, there is a genetic predeterminant there as well, because it seems like with the atypical antipsychotics, if someone's going to gain weight, they got, gain a ton of weight. Um, it's, it's usually not in that gray area. And the same thing is actually true with the SSRIs. Um, you know, the incidence of significant weight gain with sertraline, citalopram, s citalopram is really only 3 to 5% of the population gains a clinically significant amount of weight. But the ones who do, it's really impressive. The last, the last thing that I wanted to ask you, you had briefly mentioned that pregabalin, gabapentin were used uh, to augment therapy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that more for patients with anxiety? Absolutely. Yeah. For people who have pretty profound residual anxiety, you know, partial responders, and they don't have a good response to view spirone, you're kind of in a pickle. You know, it's, there is some evidence supporting the use of hydroxyzine, you know, but it's quite sedating, um, particularly for generalized anxiety disorder. And pregabalin and gabapentin may be effective as well. Uh, but again, there's no surefire solution there. There's certainly nothing as effective for those residual anxiety symptoms um, as bupropion is for those atypical symptoms. Yeah. So gabapentin and pregabalin are both structurally related to the, the neuroinhibitory molecule GABA, which itself, the receptor is a target of like the benzodiazepines and barbiturates. It doesn't bind directly to the GABA receptor, but does bind to other uh, CNS calcium, um, voltage-gated calcium uh, channels similar to the GABA molecule. So it, it provides neuroinhibitory effects in a similar fashion as GABA without the risk for sedation. Um, or at least the over risk for sedation that you would see with like benzodiazepines and barbiturates. That, that's why it affects, it, it works as an anxiolytic. Right. And the benefit with pregabalin is that it doesn't have this absorption issue that gabapentin right. does, which is why yeah. gabapentin's dosing range is so broad, is because right. of absorption problems. This is maybe an absurd practical question, but what kind of prior authorization fight do you have for pregabalin as, as augmentation therapy? I, I can't get that approved for anything. And that's why I use gabapentin. That's why I usually start yeah. there. Good tip. Failed gabapentin. I, I think we're going to have to call time on this interview. This, this was really awesome. So we might, might have to bring you back to like explore more, more questions in this realm, maybe like a, a psycho pharmacology 3.0. I think we might be calling this, this a 2.0. It's got to be 3.1. So could you give us uh, your favorite take-home points from what we discussed tonight or, or just any parting words of wisdom that you have for the audience? The first one that comes to mind is not to forget about psychotherapy. I'm, and it, it, I, I don't say that lightly. I, I really think it goes hand in hand with medication because as kind of a, the, the way I describe it to my patients is when you're profoundly depressed, you really can't see the forest from the trees. You know, all you're thinking about is how lousy you feel. And it's really hard to make any kind of insights in terms of your lifestyle or, or what you can do to get out of that abyss. Um, and so what the medication does is it acutely manages those symptoms and then you can make these leaps forward or, or even these little insights. And that's why psychotherapy is so valuable um, and why they go together so well. I, I will say that I think the benefits of psychotherapy are longer lasting than the benefits of medication. Um, uh, may not be a popular message among drug companies, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of patients would, would like to know that anyway. So, and, and that's, that's probably good counseling to give them, to motivate them to get to therapy. That, that and considering mindfulness, I think is really important. Uh, it, it's really popular in our neck of the woods here. There's some great apps uh, related to mindfulness, including Headspace, which you guys may be familiar with. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of classes. Uh, there's a great book that we used in some brain imaging studies at UCSF. Uh, called A Mindful Way Through Depression. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is one of the authors of that, uh, which it comes with this CD-ROM of guided um, meditations and so forth. And the patients I've turned that book onto have really enjoyed it. He he also, he wrote a book like, uh, I can't remember what, it, it, yeah, I'll, I'll have to put it in the show notes, but he wrote, a, he he came up with mindfulness-based stress reduction. I think he's he's up in New England at UMass and he wrote a book, I think it's like, Wherever you're going, there you are, or something exactly. like that. Um, that's pretty good introduction to sort of mindfulness and things, too. Well, just one other tip. In terms of where people go awry in treating depression or primary care, 
is what I still see a lot is people starting at doses that are too high. Um, you know, starting with Prozac, 20 milligrams a day, when there's actually compelling evidence that five milligrams is adequate for a lot of patients and the side effect burden is much less. Um, fluoxetine, I should say. Um, same with sertraline. There's really no reason to start sertraline at 50 milligrams a day. And, you know, the first question is really how well are they tolerating the dose? The second question you're asking, you know, weeks from then is, are they getting better? But if you start too high, you're never going to get to that second question. I think that's a great place to end. And uh, we can't thank you enough for all your time. And this is going to be really valuable to the audience. A lot of people will hear this. Um, so definitely you did not waste your time. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks yep. for inviting me. Thank Very you, helpful. Thanks so much. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right, Paul. We're committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need everyone else but Paul's feedback this week. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com or reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've still been and will always be Stuart Kent Brigham. And I'm Dr. Molly Hoyblind. I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. He has. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, and goodbye.